Hey folks, this is Abel James, and thanks so much for joining us on the Fat Burning Man Show, where we talk about real food and real results. So, you've heard some of these words that are bouncing all around the interwebs recently. Carnivore, keto, plant-based, vegan. But, do you know the nuances of what all these different words mean? What's the difference between keto and Atkins? What's the difference between clean keto and dirty keto? Or a therapeutic ketogenic diet to achieve some sort of end in neurological function or disease prevention or, or trying to heal some sort of, I mean, we can get really complicated with this, whether it's plant-based, carnivore, detoxes, cleanses, words are very confusing more than ever. And as it turns out, the meaning of words actually matters. So today we're here to dial in the meaning a little bit so that you'll actually figure out what to put on your plate. No matter what identity or word you're following, there are certain principles you can follow to take your health back into your own hands. So joining us on the show today is our friend Ben Azadi, a best-selling author, coach, and host of the Keto Camp podcast. And he was kind enough to uh, actually, after we were poisoned by carbon monoxide and couldn't work for months and, and we're trying to dig out of that. Ben was one of the people who kept texting me and kept emailing me. And he's just like, man, we got to get you back. You got to get you on this show. And honestly, we were so sick and, um, and even close to death during some of those moments coming out of it. I didn't know if I would ever be able to do this again. I didn't know if I'd ever be able to stand here literally and, and, and do this show and keep it coming to you. And uh, those people, you know who you are, who kept on me to, to get back at this and get better and, and, and stay at it no matter what. You're the ones who made sure that I did come back and I feel stronger and faster now. Uh, not that all the pain is gone. Uh, there, there are definitely some, some symptoms that I'm still kind of working through, but man, it's amazing what your body can recover from and you need your friends to get there. We all need each other. Social isolation is extremely damaging. It's actually used literally as torture in some countries. So be sure that, uh, especially during times like these, that you lean on each other and that um, you really appreciate your, your friends, old and new. Keep in touch more important than ever. So anyway, thank you for that, Ben. And thanks to all of you who, who have kept in touch. And got, I, I can't believe how many people I haven't talked to, even from elementary school in 20 years, who've gotten back in touch. And it's it's just wonderful. We all need each other. So thank you all for that. All right. So Ben's going to share some tips today on how he himself dropped 80 pounds and kept it off by transforming into a fat burning machine. But before we get there, here's a recent review that came in for the wild diet uh, from Amazon. He gave it five out of five stars. And he said, must have in the kitchen. Great book full of tasty recipes and also great information. The food pictures make your mouth water. I found this book to be a big help as I stepped into the world of paleo style eating and I'm happy to recommend this book to anyone. Definitely a great book worth every penny. Hey, John, thank you so much for that. I appreciate it. The Wild Diet, for those of you who don't know, is uh, my dietary approach that, that we've been doing for many years now. It was a number seven trend on Google before they started censoring us. <laughs> we have had a massive following all over the world, many thousands of people. Uh, I was on a TV show back in 2016, and The Wild Diet became a New York Times bestselling book when Kurt Morgan, my friend, the guy who I was coaching on the show, lost 87 pounds in just less than four months. It was absolutely incredible. He was able to go from 352 pounds and 52% body fat to being 87 seven pounds below that and going rock climbing for the first time. And, and so I love the transformations that I see in some of you. And I love that we can keep in touch over the years because a lot of you who transform your body and your life then become coaches yourselves and start a podcast and write your own books. And Ben is a wonderful example of someone who's done just that. Now, before we get to the show, I just want to say, uh, please go to fatburningman.com. You can find every episode of the show without outside advertising. Uh, so, Go to fatburningman.com. Make sure you sign up for our newsletter. We have many, many cool announcements coming out soon, no matter where you are. But if you are in the United States, then we have something extremely exciting right now. We've been working on this literally for years. Two new forms of vitamin C stacks with natural forms of vitamin C from botanicals. We've got vitamin C stack in capsule form. Uh, and we all know that getting your vitamins on and getting nutrients in uh, is very important normally, but especially 
right now. And so we've been very hardcore. Um, I, I, I used to think that supplements were scams and, and, and bunk, not all of them, but I, I knew that many, and I stand by that many are still scams and bunk. But when you find the real thing, a premium source that you trust, uh, and, and that's what we have found and have been taking for years, uh, you can see and feel a difference between being nutrient deficient. You can measure for that, whether it's vitamin D, B vitamins, or, 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 so many different things. There are tests available. You can get a panel of your health, take it into your own hands and see where you need to, you know, prop certain nutrients up. And so for me personally, and more than 80 or 90 percent of people out there, depending on on how you measure it, they're deficient in vitamin D and some of these other vitamins. Vitamin C can be a difficult one to get especially if you're carnivore, keto, even paleo, and, and certain people who are plant-based can have a tough time getting enough vitamin C without the sugar. So that's what we've got for you here. We've got vitamin C stack in the capsules, and then Fizzy C I'm really, really proud of because this is a powder that um, you can kind of see it right there. A little bit orangey. It's got a lovely, slight sweetness. Uh, vitamin C can be really harsh when you're taking certain powders. They can be very sour and hard to take. But this has a slight bit of sweetness in it. Uh, several different forms. We've got quercetin and, and different bioflavonoids in here. Ascorbic acid, calcium ascorbate, magnesium ascorbate as well. So we've been dialing in vitamin C stack and fizzy C for years. And it is finally ready for you folks who are in the United States. So if you are there, please go to wildsuperfoods.com with subscribe and save. You can save over 20% and we just uh, put a bunch of stuff on sale since we just launched. So if you're looking for a high quality source of nutraceuticals, of vitamins, of different stacks that you can take that helps simplify your health instead of making it more and more complicated because trust me, there are many, many different forms of vitamin C, D, and, and all the rest of them. These are tried and laboratory tested. We have been taking them ourselves for years, and I really am proud of Fizzy C, Vitamin C Stack, and of course, Mega Omega's Vitamin D Stack, Future Greens, Collagen Cocoa, Adrenal Stack, and all the other goodies that we have now available for you at wildsuperfoods.com. Really appreciate you, and don't forget, with your subscription to Wild Superfoods, you get free access to our coaching community as part of that as well. So be sure to check out the subscribe and save and we'll hook you up and make sure that you get all the nutrients you need to survive this very uncertain future that we all seem to be facing. All right, on to the show with Ben Azadi. We're chatting about Ben's journey to shedding 80 pounds and keeping it off, how to get a mental six pack, the difference between dirty keto and restorative keto, why to avoid inflammatory fats and what to eat instead, how to use intermittent fasting and extended block fasting, tips on developing the right mental attitude for long-term success, how to transform from a sugar burner to a fat burner, and tons more. Let's go hang out with Ben. All right, folks, joining us on the show is Ben Azadi, a best-selling author, coach, podcast host, and also a dude who just so happens to have shed an astounding 80 pounds of pure fat. Welcome to the show, Ben. Abel James, I'm so excited and grateful to be here with you today. Thank you. Yeah, well, you had me on your show a while back during pretty much our rock bottom of our lives and helped get me back on the scene even before I was quite ready. So you were a more important part of our story than I think you realize. But uh, I'm, I'm really honored to have you on because I think you're an example of someone who's, who's really doing great work out there and kind of a new breed of, of hybrid health coach and entrepreneur, which is definitely what it takes to survive in this day and age, whether we like it or not, you've got to be some sort of hybrid. But your story goes back farther than that, obviously. And uh, and I didn't realize that you were a vegan for like a year and a half. But but catch us up for people who aren't familiar with your work. Please just explain where you're coming from. Yeah, absolutely. So I speak on stages and people look at me, they see me as a young, fit person. And I always tell them, hey, you know what? For the first 24 years of my life, I was actually obese. I was one of those kids growing up here in Miami, Florida, where I had low self-confidence, low self-esteem. I was bullied, I was picked on. And my parents who immigrated to America from Iran in the 1970s, they were doing the best they can with what they had. 
and my mom and my dad ended up getting divorced. So my mom was raising me and my sister, and she worked three jobs, Abel. One of those jobs was an assistant manager at Kentucky Fried Chicken. Oh, <laughs> so the she smell. Would, oh, my gosh. And I loved it as a kid, right? So she yeah. would bring me back the leftovers <laughs> just about every single night, you know, and I would eat that. Sure. Being a kid. And it manifested into me just getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And being that she worked three jobs, I was left to my own devices. So I was hanging around with the wrong crowd, people who are doing drugs, selling drugs. And I'm a true believer that we become our environment. So lo and behold, I was somebody who was doing drugs and even selling drugs in high school. And that really uh, transferred into my adulthood. And I was 24 years old. Now I'm fast forwarding a little bit. Back in 2008, and this is the point of my life where I was rock bottom because yeah. uh, ex-girlfriend broke up with me. I was depressed. And when I say depressed, that is an understatement. I was actually on the internet looking for ways to kill myself, to, to take my life. Wow. Because anytime I was in a room by myself, the thoughts that I had, I was just tired of crying every day. I was tired of hurting. And I just wanted to end the suffering for myself. But I would think about my mother. I would think about what I would leave behind for her. And I didn't want to do that to my mother. So it stopped me. And I, and I truly believe that if I didn't have my mother in my life at that point in my life, I would have probably ended my life. So it kind of forced me to figure things out because I knew I was not going to take my life. So this is the point of, uh, in time of my life that you see behind me, if you're watching the video, books entered my life. Uh, yeah. I was handed books from Wayne Dyer and Bob Proctor and these amazing authors. And I started to see a whole new world that I never knew existed. And I, for the first time in my life, Abel, I took responsibility. I said, you know what? I'm actually responsible for the results I've been getting into this life. And I immediately, immediately shifted the moment I took responsibility because it took me, took me from being a, a victim of my past to being a victor of my future. And that's where everything shifted. Nine months from that moment, I went from 250 pounds down to 170 pounds. I went from 34% body fat down to 6% body fat. So for the first time in my life, and I know you have a, a story that's similar, somewhat similar, I achieved six pack abs. Yeah. <laughs> and that was a goal for me back then. But more, more importantly than that, I tell people I carved out a mental six pack and I take that over a physical six pack any day of the week. And that's where my journey started in the health and fitness space when I went through my own trans transformation back in 2008, 2009. And I love that it, that you mentioned books being a part of your journey because uh, that's the way to do it, right? I think so many people are just like, yeah, I should read a book. And then, you know, they read like maybe a book a month or like a few books a year or whatever. And, and they just kind of go through it at a very slow pace. And it's hard to remember things like that. I, for me anyway, and uh, and I'm, as many people know, an avid reader as well. I, I have great fun preparing for all of these interviews and just like ravenously reading stacks of books in like a week, like binging books instead of Netflix. Because if you do it that way, not that everything that's in books is true. That's, that's de definitely not true. But what you don't have is a feed that you're scrolling through with every one thing, every five things is an advertisement that's stealing your attention and selling you the wrong thing. It's tricking you into thinking the wrong way, right? Books are different from that. So it, maybe how, how did you get into books at the beginning? And what would you recommend to people who aren't into books yet? Yeah, it's, it's, you bring up a great point. That's an awesome question because for me growing up, I hated to read. I was yeah. one of those kids who did the bare minimum in high school and college just to get by. But once I started reading books that uh, really resonated with my highest values, mm -hmm. that's what made the biggest difference for me. But here's a mistake I made. I was so excited about books that I would read 15, 20 different books within a month from all these different authors. And what it did for me was just paralyzed me because I had this, <laughs> this authority saying, hey, you should do yeah. it this way. And then I have another yeah. authority, you should be doing it that way. So I realized that instead of just spreading myself wide and reading a whole bunch of books, I'm going to select a hand few of authors that I have a track record of what I want to accomplish. I'm just going to go deep with them. And that's where mm -hmm. my results uh, escalated. But books are fantastic. And if you're not somebody who likes to actually physically read a book, you could listen to the audio book, you could listen yeah. to podcasts like this. So there's so many options out there. But for me, it, it's made the biggest difference in my life. Yeah. And there's, there's no excuse to stop learning. We always need to keep that education going. And, and to your point, yeah, it's, it's wonderful in prepping for these interviews too, because not everyone has, has books, but they all have something that I can go through. And we all learn in different ways. I love learning through audio and, and reading 
and video doesn't do as much for me, but some people just love video and, and like can't get it without that other piece. And so I think that that just goes to say that there are different ways to learn all of this. And there are different leaders in this health space as well who are worth following. And we all kind of teach in different ways. We're all learning from each other, but it can feel lonely out there, can it? Especially as a health coach, I think uh, it can be isolating in a lot of ways. What would you recommend to, to people who might feel like they're giving out a lot of advice, but aren't necessarily like receiving that education that they need and that, that stimulation to keep it going? Because you've been doing it for long enough. I'm sure there have been ups and downs in, in your coaching journey as well. Yeah, it's definitely evolved over the years. Uh, and, and with the amount of information out there, it's a, it's a gift and a curse. It's really a double edged sword. And I ask a lot of the, a lot of people I interview sometimes, you know, how, how can somebody decipher who, who to choose to listen to? Because even like in the keto and fasting space, which is primarily my niche, we have amazing influencers. We have educators out there who for the most part agree on, on the fundamentals of it, but then there's some things that are completely different. And then you have the person who's watching or listening, who's just paralyzed. How do I listen to, you know, who's yeah. right in this scenario? But you, you said yeah. it, I mean, whoever resonates with, with you, their personality resonates with you and they have a proven track record and they have people they've coached and have a proven track record. That's mm -hmm. probably a good idea for you to uh, start finding out if that person's right for you. And how do you know? Well, you start experimenting you start applying what you're learning. And if at the end of the day, if you're getting results, then uh, it's working. And if you're not getting results, then that person's probably not the person for you. So I think the results don't lie. At the end of the day, that's what's most important. For me and my coaching clients, I used to teach the whole eat every two to three hours, keep the metabolism revved up. You know, we got to make sure that we're feeding the body, uh, eating right before bed to man maintain muscle mass, uh, taking high dose fish oil. Now I do the complete opposite. I don't, I don't recommend any of that. So as I evolve, I tell my clients, Hey, um, actually I was wrong and this is what the science shows and let's, let's try this for now. And then we kind of go from there. So I'm always changing just like you, you're adapting. That's the way we should be. Yeah, being locked into a dogmatic way of thinking isn't going to work in this world. <laughs> it's not going to work for long anyway. I did that when I was a vegan for a year and a half. Right. Yeah, talk about that because I think so many people before they they hit, you know, kind of our way of eating went through the vegan vegetarian thing I did for years on and off and uh, it ne it never quite worked for me. <laughs> How to go for you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I I did it back in 2013 when I didn't really know how to read studies. Um so I read the China study, which is that book that can yeah, which was me. not a study <laughs> i know <laughs> so funny right but back then i didn't really know the difference sure. and uh, i really just believe the author credible authors so i i said okay it's well, a convincing book i mean i gotta say you read that book and it's like wow this is the truth yeah totally and and, and then you actually if you understand how to read studies you go read what they list and you realize oh yeah. this is actually not that that you know convincing right. it's not that promising so um i read the book and i read a couple of other books out there and i decided okay i'm going to become a, a strict vegan i'm going to experiment see how it works for me you know what the first four or five months i felt great i was actually um at, my hormones were better my energy levels were better my skin was better and then i hit that what's that vegan wall right that plateau but at this point in my life i was dogmatic about it i thought it was the end all be all diet i was saving the world it's not contributing to animals being tortured and I put myself in this box and I stuck with it for a year and a half. And my health just started to deteriorate every single month after month four or month five. And I realized that maybe this is not working for me. And that's when I got into the work of your work, actually, and, and Paul Check, uh, Dave Asprey. And I realized that maybe this is doing more harm than good. So I decided to actually get off of that. And I transitioned into the keto diet from the vegan diet, which is almost opposite. Yeah. Um, and everything improved from there. But I learned, you know, I, I extracted what worked for me and then I discarded what didn't work for me. And then I kind of synthesized that into an approach that worked for me. So the saving the world and saving animals piece is, is one thing that's, you know, all over documentaries and all over virtue signaling and social media and that sort of thing these days. Maybe we can dig into that a little bit more because I think while it's, it's, it's certainly something that we should all try to do is make the world a more sustainable place and, and treat uh, lives better, whether they're human or animal, or I think plant too, like according to nature religions, ancient ones, the earth itself is a being and is alive and we need to treat that with respect. And so um, anyway, maybe you could just talk a little bit about your approach to transitioning from that, you know, like eating something with a face 
after not for a while is is a transition. So how did you handle that? And and how do you think about sustainability now? Yeah, great question. The way I handled it was uh, I transitioned into some eggs and fish. That was kind of, I had that for a few weeks and then I started having the other animal products. But with that being said, uh, I, I agree. You know, the, the similarities between the veganism and carnivore and keto, paleo, they all agree on, hey, staying away from animals that were tortured, that lived a, a, a bad life. You yeah. know, we don't want to, I don't want to contribute to that. So the way I do it is I try to get the highest quality possible. You teach a lot about this, you know, sustainable, uh, grass fed, grass finished. That's actually going to help the planet. It's going to restore our soil. I, I contribute to uh, Dr. Zach Bush's farmer's footprint, which is all for restoring the farmland because we're running yeah. out of quality farmland. So I'm all for that. So when I say I transitioned to keto and I teach keto, I teach a, a high quality restorative approach to keto. And if you do it that re- that way, that's the way that the world is design- designed to be. Yeah, that's such a great point too. And, and when keto really started to take off, I was annoyed, uh, like carnivore and like some of these other terms, when they take off, I'm, I'm just annoyed because a lot of times the first thing that people see is the exact wrong thing. It's like a caricature, you know, and, and so a lot of the things things that I was seeing and the questions that I would get from people. It's just like, they're doing keto as if it were Atkins, where it's just like you eat nothing but meat and cream cheese, and it doesn't need to be organic. You can have these, these fat bombs that are made with in soda and stuff. And it's totally keto. You know what I mean? So, um, can you, can you help distinguish words are so tricky these days? I don't think words have ever been trickier than they are now, but can you explain the difference between, I guess, dirty keto and, and your version of keto? Yeah, you're talking about. Yeah, I love the question. Yeah, the keto is not necessarily a diet; it's a metabolic process, and right. it's, it's been around since humans have been around. So it's not a fad, although it is trending. It's a fact. It's just a process the body has been designed to go through. In fact, every single society, every single culture in the history of this world experienced some form of ketosis because yeah. their environment, right? So it's not mm-hmm. really about eating a whole bunch of fat. It's about the carbohydrates getting low enough to tap into this alternative fuel source, which can be actually a very healing fuel source if you do it the right way. So Great with, point. Yeah, thank you. With keto being so popular, we have all these keto products. We have all these keto educators out there teaching you how to go to McDonald's and, eat, and be keto. Um, and I, you know, I respect them from trying to educate their community, but that's not the way that I teach it. Uh, the way I teach it is, yeah, there you, could, you can get into ketosis by eating inflammatory fats, but you're not going to get healthy. A lot of people come to me to do keto for weight loss, but I teach them the way I teach it. And then they stay for the health benefits because, because we don't, we don't lose weight to get healthy. We we get healthy to lose weight and that's how you get long-term results. So the difference between dirty keto and I'll call it clean keto, the version that I teach, um, there's a few things to distinguish here. Number one, the types of fats that you're eating. The, the worst ones out there are the vegetable oils. So canola, corn oil, soybean oil, cottonseed oil, even sunflower oil and peanut oil. These are inflammatory fats that stay on our cell membranes, creating inflammation for a long time. In fact, there was a study. There's a study in a book called The PEO Solution by Professor Brian Peskin, who's been on my Keto Camp podcast. He showed a plate of French fries that was fried in canola oil resulted in 132 days of cell membrane inflammation. Wow. So that means, That's a long time. Yeah, so that means five minutes of pleasure, five months of dysfunction from this inflammatory fat. Now, you might be hearing this and thinking, yeah, but French fries aren't keto. But it doesn't matter. If if you're frying your uh, eggs or you're cooking your beef in these inflammatory fats, it's going to create inflammation and you're Mm -hmm. not going to get the results you want. So that's inflammatory keto. Even a lot of the pasteurized dairy can be inflammatory for a lot of people. So I would recommend, at least as you're transitioning into keto, to maybe reduce your dairy and have some raw grass-fed dairy instead. Stay away from the pasteurized So the clean version is going to be avocado and avocado oil, olive, olive oil, coconut, coconut oil, grass-fed, grass-finished beef, wild-caught fish. I mean, you have a whole list in your wild diet. You could just follow that. That's, That's a variation of clean keto. So it's important to understand the difference because you can be doing keto but doing it the wrong way. And if that's you and you're hearing this, hopefully this is an awareness for you to get transitioned to more of a clean approach. You'll get the results you want if you do that. Yeah. And it's, it's worth it too. And if you get any results by doing it the wrong way, which a lot of people do, then actually you, you've kind of got one step up because you're on your way to doing it the clean way. And, and especially if you've developed 
the biological machinery to start running well on fat and utilizing your fat stores, then, uh, then once you start eating clean, you'll notice, you know, there's a big difference between those crappy oils and, uh, and a clean one. I mean, your body knows the difference, but it, it, I was reading some more recent research, the more we're finding out about inflammation, that uh, they're starting to link it to a whole bunch of different emotional problems and mental illnesses, including depression. And so um, I know that I struggled a lot more with with the way that I thought and anxiety and, and things like that when I was eating um, what I consider the wrong way using these, you know, kind of like more processed carbs as fuel or using sugar uh, as fuel, but not in the form of sugar, even when I was doing it, then I was trying to be healthy, right? But but mentally, um, I experienced a different state than I feel now, you know, like a decade later after running on fat as my primary fuel and really just fasting most of the time. Most of my life, I am not eating fat. I'm not consuming fat to burn fat. And that's another big thing that you mentioned. I think it's such a great point. You don't need to be <laughs> blasting through all of these amounts of fat in order to burn fat. That's not how it works. So, um, yeah, wait, what else? do you think helps people kind of make that transition from, I, I don't know, I'm kind of doing this as a joke, you know, having these fat bombs and then wait a minute, I, I accidentally lost a bunch of weight, but then they're in that dirty keto, I don't know what to do mode. Let's help them transition a little bit more to that clean keto. What else do you do to help them get there? The number one thing that I see, the most important missing piece that I've seen with keto is having healthy bile flow to break down the fat. Yes. So, so many people don't even have a gallbladder, right? So let's, let's rewind for a second. The liver produces bile. Bile, this greenish fluid, is stored in the gallbladder. And then when you eat fat, that fat needs to be broken down. And that what breaks down is the bile. The bile helps absorb all those amazing nutrients, the vitamin A, D, E, and K. And bile removes toxins from the body. Toxins get bound to bile and the body removes it. So bile is so important. And a lot of people, their liver has been beat up. This four and a half pound, I call soccer mom of all Oregon who does everything and anything, <laughs> has been beat up, right? Because it has to detoxify toxins. It has to deal with uh, this overload of carbohydrates. So when we go into keto, a lot of people can't break down the fat and they have digestive issues and they don't feel that good. So I always recommend adding in a lot of bitters. And uh, my mentor, Dr. Pampa, and also Dr. David Jockers talks a lot about this for yeah. good reason, and you do too. Uh, bitters are going to help your, your body stimulate healthy bile flow. So especially if you don't have a gallbladder, throw in the bitters, throw in some arugula, some dark chocolate, even some organic shade-grown coffee can help stimulate it. And artichoke is a super keto food because not only does it help build bile, it also has fiber, which can help slow down the absorption of fat to help with your digestion. I also like thyme and rosemary. Just smelling these herbs helps stimulate these, these pancreatic juices and uh, lemons and limes, apple cider vinegar. These are key things to add to a ketogenic approach that will go a long way with breaking down those nutrients, absorbing it, and helping to remove toxins. I agree with that. Yet, carnivore is taking off more than ever. And so many people, you know, one of the reasons I was annoyed when I saw it taking off is because, um, well, number one, it's not quite carnivore because a lot of people are eating some amount of plants with it, which makes it omnivore. But also that people are kind of doing it with the same way, it's just muscle meats or hamburger patties or whatever. So uh, what's your take on how that's going down and how do you answer questions about it? Because it's the way I see it is it's like a pretty easy sell to say, you know what? You never have to eat veggies again. You never have to eat any plants. You never have to cook them. You never have to, you know, it's like, that's a little too easy, I think, is the way that, not that there isn't a therapeutic benefit, but anyway, what's your take? I think, I think there's a, a use for it. I think it's a tool in the health shed. Um, like all diet, I think all diets work, just not long-term. Even keto, the way I teach keto. Yeah, is they're all tools, right? They're all tools. So the way I would use carnivore, which I'm going to do 30 days of carnivore, by the way. Cool. Yeah, I, I, I've considered it too, just to see what happens, you know? Ex exactly. But um, the way I see it is, hey, if you have leaky gut, if you have autoimmune, then these meats, if you do nose to tail carnivore the right way, could be a great way to kind of heal that. But the solution, I believe, is not to stay carnivore. It's to fix the gut while you're right. doing that. Once right. the gut is fixed, then you can start incorporating some of the other plants because there are benefits to it. Yeah, it can be a stressor to the body, digesting plants, but it could be a good type of stress as long as your stress bucket is not 
overloaded. So I think uh, the carnivore diet is a great tool, like we said, to use short term, especially for somebody with leaky gut as you fix that gut and then you transition away from it. It's a great thing to keep in mind too, just because there's a tendency to get carried away with anything. It's like, oh, green smoothies are good. I'm going to have like eight pounds of vegetables every morning. And then you're just like gassy all day and you're having like hundreds of grams of fiber and it's completely unnecessary. You know, so it's like, I think it is a good reminder that that you never get there. You know, you're going to have benefit from consuming things sometimes and from taking a break from, from things sometimes. And, uh, (laughs) <laughs> and the pendulum will swing back and forth. But it's interesting because if anything's popular right now, it's just elimination diets. It's extreme elimination diets. And I think that can be a really excellent thing because those are very powerful tools. Exactly, because a lot of people are eating things that they don't realize are, it's causing inflammation. And the top culprits are the high oxalate foods. So if you are, have an oxalate sensitivity, then a short-term carnivore would be a great approach for you. But also, so in my, I have my Keto Camp Academy and I take somebody from being a sugar burner to being a fat burner within 28 days. And in the first 28 days, I tell them, okay, we're going to transition you. I want you to avoid these suspect foods. And you know, Dave Asprey has like his bulletproof chart. Um, So we have the nightshades, we have even almonds and spinach because they're higher in oxalates and then pasteurized dairy and grains. And if you just remove that short term, you should see and feel a reduction in inflammation because, uh, and then it'll help you feel better. And then you could kind of fix the gut and then transition those foods back in. But what we're doing here is what you just said. We're eliminating these foods, letting the body heal. And then we can start to reintroduce and see how the body reacts to that. What about when people are eating this way and then just don't for a while and totally fall off the wagon? Um, how do you save them? Because a lot of times that'll happen and then you lose them forever, right? So if they're eating keto and then all of a sudden they get off and they, they're just like, this didn't work for me type of thing? Yeah, well, well, okay. So I think what happens, especially if, if there's a vegan who accidentally eats a, a hamburger or a little piece of cheese pizza, then it's like you're not a vegan anymore. Right. And so you can't be vegan you can, or you have to keep it a secret. And then it's, you've seen a whole lot of meltdowns on social media from these influencers, right? Who are just like, they accidentally like ate a piece of fish one time. Yeah. Like their careers and lives are ruined. So I think that's just a high, high profile example of what you don't want to have happen in this life, right? Where it's like, none of us are perfect. And it's not like being in ketosis and measuring your ketones. Um, and having them always be low is the goal either. And drifting out of ketosis sometimes shouldn't be something that like pulls you away from ever being healthy again, right? So what's your recommendation there for people who, uh, who have a tendency to go from extreme diet to extreme diet and being like, oh, this isn't working for me anymore because I had some fish, right? <laughs> <laughs> right. I would say that it's never about the setback. It's always about the get back. And yeah. a lot of people, they dwell on that wedding they went to over the weekend where they had all these foods that were not part of the plan. And then they just think about it for days and they're like, oh, I'm already messed up. Let me continue this uh, mm-hmm. mess up, right? And, you know, it's, 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 it's fine. The body actually could get benefits from having a day or two where you feast. Now, we don't want to have those inflammatory fats. And of course, we want to feast on healthy food, but that's not the reality of it. We're going to have days and we're going to have events. It's also important to enjoy your social outings with your family and your friends and not just be in a box. I think it's we want to live longer, but also have a higher quality of life while we live longer. We don't want to just be isolated. So I think there is a, a balance there. But the message I would say is what I just said is never about the setback. Always about to get back. If you have a coach, a coach could help guide you back on track. But the body likes it when you create adaptation. So when you have a day, the way I teach it is to get keto adapted, get into ketosis for about two to three months. And if you don't have something like metabolic syndrome, like insulin resistance or diabetes, then let's start having one day or two days out of the week where we have a feast day. We're doing a paleo-ish type of version of uh, eating. We're having high healthy carbs. We're intentionally getting out of ketosis but then we'll go right back in the next day or two. That's what it's about, it's that metabolic flexibility. The body will actually give you better results doing that than staying in ketosis, at least from what I've seen. Yeah, metabolic flexibility is a big term that's come up on the, on the podcast recently, talking to a whole bunch of different people. And I think that's what it is. It's less about this ultimate goal of seeing keto and ketosis as where you always want to be. It's, it's more about having the skill of burning fat, the body's ability to do that and the machinery to do that, that where you want to have um, that flexibility to be able to go back 
and forth between those different things. Looking historically at, at when, and, and even in the animal world, at how they use fructose and sugars to fatten up, to you know, start fat storage because they need fat. The fat isn't a thing that's always bad, right? Like we need to be less binary, I think, in our, in our thinking and accept that it's all kind of gray area, but there are fundamentals that kind of stay the same. And real food, it's hard to go wrong with. And single ingredients, same as well. And I think also getting diversity into your diet is extremely important. Um, but I just kind of want to tie the, the diet piece up in a little boat so we can move on to another piece that's unique about you where you're not really, or, or at least growing up, you weren't an athlete and you weren't someone who was like always out there getting after it and, and kind of like the fitness type. And I know a lot of people listening aren't as well. And, and so if you've never really gotten into doing CrossFit style workouts, for example, that can also be a difficult and, and challenging transition. So, um, so let's talk about that. How did it work for you? And how do you train people to get over that hump of, of, you know, it's embarrassing when you don't know what to do. And you first start doing it, you're going to be bad. How do you get over that? Yeah, so when I start, first started working out when I was 250 pounds, and I wanted to drop my weight, I did P90X. I, I was working out at home because I was embarrassed, like you said, to actually go to yeah. the gym and kind of not know what I'm doing and look, look like a fool. So I did that. And that worked for me. Uh, but what I would recommend, what I teach now is to let's start where you're, where you are at. You know, if you are doing nothing, not even going for walks, let's start doing some walk, walking. Let's, you know, walking is so underrated, but let's go for some walks. The body loves to move. You're talk, you talk about that all the time. Movement is more important than exercise. Meaning if you go to CrossFit five times a week, but you're sitting at your desk the remainder of the day, you're not as you're not better off than the person who's just on their couch all day because you're actually more susceptible to injury and getting sick. So we want to actually move. And yeah, we want to work out. We want to train intentionally. But if you're somebody who has not done it, we wouldn't just be a couch potato and do a CrossFit wad tomorrow. That's going to look ugly. So I would start with walking and then I would start working on those foundational movements like the squats, even if it's just sitting down to a chair and standing up, you know, doing some shoulder presses, some bench press, the foundational multi-joint recruitment movements Start with that, less of the curls, less of the isolated movements, and then you just build from there. How do you know if your exercise is too much or too little? I always tell people, if you feel worse after exercise, like the remainder of the day, you probably did too much. Your mitochondria, your cells couldn't handle it. Your adrenals couldn't adapt. So scale it down a little bit. If you feel better, if you feel energized, then you could start building and working from that. So that's mm -hmm. a good way to gauge it, and that's the way I teach it. Yeah. Uh, what about building kind of fundamental strength in the right places? So many people are unable to do a deep squat to get up from the floor, for example, without, you know, putting their arms down in, in awkward ways or leaning against something. What do you see as some fundamental skills that people should should build that way? Yeah, the fundamentals are important when it comes to fitness and all areas of health. Uh, squatting is one of the best exercises that you could learn to do the right way. So you would start with a chair, you would start with a chair, and then you would kind of get a chair that's a little bit lower. So you go a little bit deeper. Um, if you work with a personal trainer who understands this, this, that'll be a great option if it's in your budget for sure. But if you're just somebody who wants to do this on your own, there are amazing resources on YouTube that you could find how to actually progress into a deep squat. But squatting is uh, uh, paramount. If you could get to a natural squat without being assisted, uh, using assistance, that'll be great for the body. Getting into a sprint, you know, sprinting is so great for the mitochondria within ourselves to start duplicating and creating more energy. So sprinting and squats and push-ups and bench press, these are the foundational ones that you want to work and build towards. And then you could revolve, add other things to that, but that'll be the base of your fitness. Yeah. And then how do you adjust that down the road for people? Because sometimes it's it's a matter of like, they get into it and they want to get stronger and stronger and stronger, but eventually you kind of hit whatever that plateau is. And you're like, wait, why am I doing this again? Like, do I really need to be running 430 miles in my thirties <laughs> or whatever, you know, it's like, or in my forties or fifties, so many people come up against that. So how do you manage goals and expectations? And, and, and once again, make sure that people don't fall off because a lot of times people go so hard and then get hurt or, or get too burned out to keep going. Yeah, I mean, definitely having a goal, like a, a, a target you want to hit would be important, whether it's, I don't know, you want to bench press 200 pounds or you want to back squat a certain amount of weight could be for somebody for that approach. 
or if you want to walk 30 minutes or go up five flights of stairs without getting out of breath. I mean, whatever your goal is that you want to have, keeping it in front of you. Um, I'm a big believer in writing down your goals, keeping it in front of you. In fact, I have a, a notebook by my nightstand that I've written down my goals before bed and in the morning uh, for over three years. I haven't missed one night or one morning for wow, over three years. Wow, very cool. Along with my gratitude because it helps me feed the beast, I call it. It keeps my my goals in front of me and I'm less likely to kind of uh, fall off track when I'm doing that. So that's one way. Something Do you else want to share I, a couple real quick before we get to the next one? Yeah, so uh, my goals. Yeah, I'm, I'm just curious. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So one of the goals is to uh, have the podcast reach over 100,000 downloads per month, uh, the YouTube channel to hit a million subscribers by the end of this year. Uh, I have a goal to speak on more stages. You know, I want to speak and influence more people. Uh, the overall goal for myself and, and Keto Camp is to educate and inspire 1 billion people. Uh, that's the lifelong goal, right? So every everything is kind of reverse engineering towards that. Uh, so those are a few of the goals in terms of uh, business, business-related goals. Very cool. Yeah, thank All you. Right, keep on rolling if you want, because because that's such an important thing is being clear about your intentions, your goals, and where you're headed, where you're going. Yeah, and I also have like I have a goal card that I read, I keep with me all day. So this says, "I am so happy and grateful now that my Keto Camp YouTube channel has one million subscribers." Uh, on my <laughs> <laughs> on my desktop here, my computer has it's Photoshop, but it has me holding a gold plaque saying, "Congratulations from YouTube for having a million subscribers." So I, I do things like this because it helps me really just vision hear it in a sense, but it keeps it in front of me. It keeps me on course. I learned this from Bob Proctor, by the way. Um, yes. So keep your goals in front of you. Uh, it's important to always change up your workouts. A great personal trainer, a great coach is always going to vary your workouts. One day you'll be doing squats. One day you'll be doing burpees. I mean, whatever it is for your activity level, but always change it up. And then here's the missing component. It's if you hit a plateau with your fitness, it's not about exercising more. It's probably about getting more sleep and recovering from that workout because we don't burn fat and build muscle in the gym. We do it during sleep. So I would go in that area and really focus and hone in on your sleep. That's what I would do. Do you quantify your own sleep? Yeah, I use the aura ring. Uh, so yeah, I do me quantify. Too. Yeah. Um, have you noticed with that ring that you get a whole lot of sleep uh, during the time that you're in bed or are there missing hours? There are times uh, I'm in bed that I'm not asleep. So yeah, um, I think it's called, what is it called? It's, uh, there's, there's a name for it in there, but yeah, there's a period of time where uh, it takes me usually about 15 minutes to fall asleep, Abel. And yeah. then, and then depending on the night, uh, I, I moved into this, this new apartment here in, my, in Bay Harbor Islands. There's a lot of EMFs and my sleep has been mm. worse because of it. So I yep. now sleep on a grounding mat and I do a, a few things there. But yeah, there are some And that times, helped? Yeah, it's been helping me. Uh, I've been using a little bit of some CBD oil before bed. So I experiment. I also you wear earplugs and an eye mask. So I do things. Big fan of sleep. I think sleep is the most underrated thing out there. It's uh, too many people sleep on sleep, I believe. <laughs> totally. You know, it's it's interesting when we were uh, going from place to place this summer, not not really having a place to live. We were in Steamboat, Colorado for a while, which is, which is a big place where Olympians train. And so we were in a couple of Airbnbs that like some legit, you know, people who train own this place and they just rented it out other times for people to, to, uh, to stay there. And I can tell you in those houses, um, by far, like pretty much everything in those houses was Spartan and it, there was nothing in there except for the bedroom where it had like that mattress was, was thousands of dollars. Every single inch of the shade of the light was, was blocked out completely black, um, what else? It had it had face masks. We we travel with those earplugs. Just uh, all sorts of different different things in the bedroom were decked out for sleep, and we slept like babies there. But um, one thing that I've noticed tracking with the Aura Ring in particular, because I tracked with a Fitbit and a few other pieces of technology just on and off over the years, is that um, some some of the early sleep tracking stuff would say like, "Good job, good on you. You were in bed for nine and a half hours last night." It's like, mm. oh. I wake up and it's like, good on me. The water ring is just like, you're in bed for nine and a half hours, but you got five hours of sleep. And it's like, what? What? No, I thought I was doing so good though. And that's a really interesting thing that happens when you start to quantify it because you, you have to be honest. Sometimes you wake up feeling pretty good, but later on in the day, all your energy has gone. And that's because of a poor night's sleep. You wouldn't necessarily track that though. If you were in bed, not sleeping, but like half conscious and not knowing why. So to your point, 
the the EMFs was the big thing that we ran into in Austin as as it grew and grew and grew. And these apartment buildings and hotels got bigger and bigger. All of a sudden, Wi-Fi, instead of, you know, you drop down a little thing to choose the network, instead of seeing three, you see like 65 or 250 things drop down. And all those are going into your body. Another big thing that interfered with us sleeping at different places, traffic outside the window, you know, the sound, the sirens, um, backing up buses. There are so many things that you wouldn't even know. Oh, another big one. This was so huge. At an Airbnb, there was a, a water heater timer that was manual. And every night, like I, I tracked on my ring, I would wake up at the same time. And it was, and I didn't know this because I was sleeping, but it was a hard thunk when that thing turned on. And so it's like, long story short, I'm trying to say that most people should should try to track this from time to time, even if you think you're doing a really good job with sleep. Once you track a little bit more, you can be more honest about those weird things that might be interrupting your sleep without you even knowing it. And there are a lot of them. There are a lot of them. Yeah, you make a great point because if, if you could figure out if you're getting good sleep or not, um, if you're not getting good sleep and you're doing so many other things right, the keto, the fasting, the working out that we talked about, but your sleep is just not the way we want it to be, it'll be very hard to get those results. But if you could change your sleep habits and kind of get into that groove, getting quality sleep, everything else you're doing will upgrade just automatically. It's so important because you could go weeks without food, you could go weeks without exercise, but you cannot go weeks without sleep. Your body will turn into a crazy person. So you got to really start with the foundation. And like you said, this is a great, uh, the Aura Ring is a great way to track that. Yeah. And there are other ways of tracking it too, but keeping your eye on it. I was so surprised and I still am where it's like, I'm good about being in bed for a long time, but I'm not always good about sleeping. Even if I'm in bed for 10, 11 hours, sometimes it's five or six hours of sleep. Other times it can't, I can crack seven or eight, but very rarely do I get any more than that. And, uh, and I think it's really difficult to sleep in this modern world. It just is because so many of us are assaulted with all of these different lights, sounds, and various sensations that we're not, we're not used to. And it cracks us out. So it's just another excuse to go and unplug and go camping or go to the beach in Miami, go get some grounding in. That's another thing that can really help. Um, and we do have just a little bit more time here, Ben, but I want, I want to make sure we talk about the entrepreneurship piece as well. Because I think a big thing that happens, um, hopefully, is that once people get their way of eating and, and, and moving down, they get extra energy and extra time. Um, also with fasting, you got to get hours of your day back to do cool stuff with. And fasting also, I feel like can give you a little more revved up energy. And so it's a big thing for entrepreneurs. Let's talk, let's talk about that. I've seen a lot of people start businesses right when they nail the health thing. And it seems like you kind of are doing that and, and have done that. And I, it's just my favorite thing to see, I got to say. <laughs> oh, that's awesome, Abel. Yeah, thank you for that. And you're, you're so right. It's like a superpower. I do feel like doing keto and fasting the right way is a superpower that really sets you apart from anybody else who's not doing this. Because let's talk about fasting real quick. I did the math because I speak a lot in front of entrepreneurs and real estate investors, and I teach them how to utilize this to grow their business and scale up because I believe health is our true wealth. What good is all that money if you don't have the energy and vitality to use it? And being unhealthy is the most selfish thing you can do because not only are you robbing yourself, but your family, your friends, your business partner, they don't get your truest personality, truest version. So uh, health is so important. When you fast, for instance, Let's say uh, an entrepreneur listening right now, a business owner, they spend um, 15 minutes a day for breakfast, right? And they spend 15 bucks for that breakfast. After a year, if they just did fasting and they skip that and they use that time to meditate or they use that time for whatever reason to build their business, they get back two and a half days after a year. They also get back $3,900 that they could use for their business. So you get time, you get money. And your body is pumping you full of these counter-regulatory hormones when you're fasting, which the body starts to think when you're fasting, oh crap, I haven't had any food in 16 hours, 18 hours. We need to keep this body alert, focused, and driven so we could go out there and hunt and kill our next meal. The body does not give a crap and does not know that I could go on my phone and hit the Uber Eats app and have a millennial knocking on my door in 30 minutes. The body doesn't care about that. We're hardwired for the old school. So it will raise counter-regulatory hormones and literally pump you full of energy to go hunt and kill. But the 
ultimate hack here for an entrepreneur is we're going to use all that energy, all that focus to crush the task at hand, to crush an interview like I'm doing right now. I'm fasted right now to crush a talk, a sales uh, conversation, whatever it is. So it's one of the most potent tools you can have in your entrepreneurial toolbox. I think of it as an extra gear. You know, it's it's like an overdrive where you're just like in cruise mode, but also it, I find it easier to listen to people and I find it easier to talk. Whereas it's not quite of, uh, as fast paced and intense of a conversation a lot of times over dinner. That's more of rest and digest mode. And so I think it is in many ways a different state of the body and the mind and the physiology when you're kind of in that doing work, hunting mode before like this is the work mode we are getting food so that we can rest and digest and and have fun later and uh un unfortunately so many people haven't really experienced that mode and built that machinery because it does take a few weeks there is a transition but before we go what what advice would you give to other people who are flirting with the idea of making this a life's calling the the coaching piece or starting their own business around health if they want to um could you ask that again what, what do you mean specifically yeah. So there are a lot of people who, um, in their journey, they find health and then they're looking for something to do with it and they don't want to work that dead end job anymore for the corporate machine. And they want to do something like you're doing. Um, how, how can we egg them on? Cause we need all the help we can get. Yeah, we do need a lot of help. There's a lot of people who are hurting out there. Uh, I, I would say that it's, it's, if you've gone through it yourself, a health transformation and you, this is your highest value. Like you really love studying this and sharing it. Then you have a, a duty and a responsibility to really get it out into the world and, and make a difference. So, um, my answer now at this, on this day, in this day and age today would be to utilize a platform like YouTube and podcasting. I think those are two major platforms that you can reach the world with. Um, YouTube is my biggest platform followed by the podcasting. Uh, so I would recommend that. And sharing it with your friends, with your family, and building that community. And then uh, as you build that tribe and you just show up every single day, you'll develop a following uh, as long as you continue showing up. And it's not going to happen overnight. Like for me, it was crickets. It was even for my YouTube channel. But I committed to it. I committed to putting out two videos on my YouTube channel every single week. Six months in, I was a little frustrated with it, but I said, I committed. And if you commit, there's no quitting, right? Yeah. So then all of a sudden, one of my videos about keto fruits takes off. It almost has a million views right now. And the channel just grows, right? I think it was the universe really testing me to see if I'm committed to this cause. And I am yeah. committed to this cause. So I broke the universe and I pushed forward. So that, that would be, <laughs> that'd be my advice right there. Break the universe. <laughs> That's persist. great advice. Yeah. That's what it feels like. It, it really feels like that. When you make something like that happen and it's big, you broke the universe in a good way. <laughs> in a good way. Yeah, exactly. So <laughs> the last thing I'd share, uh, I would share is that there's going to be times where you're, you f I, I felt like a failure, but I truly believe that failure does not really exist until you quit, until you give up. It's really just feedback. And if you could keep adjusting your eyes on your goals, like I talked about on the, on the prize, then you just use that as a stepping stone to kind of navigate. Nothing is really in the way. It's all on the way and just keep pushing forward and surround yourself with people like Abel, people who are uh, an environment that you want because you do become your environment. And that's what I did. I surrounded myself with those who saw greatness in me and had the results that I wanted to accomplish. And that's what I would share. Right on, man. All right. So what's the best place for people to find your books and everything else that you're working on? Well, YouTube is the best place to, to look me up. Just put in Keto Camp, uh, Camp with the K on YouTube. And then I also have my Keto Camp podcast, which Abel was on. You could start with that episode right there. Go listen to that amazing interview that Abel gave on my Keto Camp podcast. And if you type in Ben Azadi on Amazon, you could see all my books. Right on. Ben, you are doing such great work. We need you more than ever. Thanks so much. I appreciate you. Right back at you, Abel. Thank you. Hey folks, this is Abel James and I'm extremely excited to be here today with one of our favorite supplements of all time, Fizzy C. It's buffered vitamin C with citrus bioflavonoids in the form of a tasty little powder. Now the trick with this is just start with a little bit at a time. Uh, as opposed to some other vitamin C's that taste horrible, really sour and hard to get down, this actually is pretty easy to get down too much. And so if you have too much vitamin C, <laughs> you know what happens. So the, the point is you want to take a small amount, it's easy to overdo it with these. So 
just a teaspoon or less is, is good to get started. But what Fizzy C is, is a high quality source of vitamin C in the form of ascorbic acid, calcium ascorbate, magnesium ascorbate as well. And then there's potassium bicarbonate that's added as well as a buffering agent. And this makes it a little bit easier uh, to get down. And I find this to be pretty much the tastiest form of vitamin C out there. So if you're interested in Fizzy C and you have any questions, please get in touch. We can't wait to see how you like our brand new Fizzy C. Get in touch and let us know. This is Abel signing off. We'll talk to you soon. Well, hey there, listener. This is Abel one more time, and I just want to say thank you for listening to this episode of the Fat Burning Man Show. If you liked it, don't forget to hit that subscribe button wherever you might be listening to or watching this show right now. And if you have a second, please leave me a quick review for the Fat Burning Man Show. I read every single one of them, and every time you leave a review, it gives us a little boost in the rankings, and that helps other people find this show. And if you can think of someone else who might enjoy and benefit from this free show, please take a second to share it with a friend or family member. And if they're like, what is this fat burning man thing? That's a really silly name. You could be like, you're right, but here's the deal. We've recorded over 250 episodes of the Fat Burning Man Show with thought leaders in health from all over the world. And so far... We've won four awards, hitting number one in health in more than eight countries internationally. We have more than 30 million downloads already, but we're just getting started. I can't believe any of this, by the way, and and couldn't do any of this without you. So thanks once again. But here's some more good news. You can download and listen to every single episode of the Fat Burning Man Show for free with zero outside advertisements, no outside sponsors, and no corporate overlords. All you have to do is type in fatburningman.com. We'll give you a a second here just to type it in, fatburningman.com. And you'll get all the show notes, transcripts, and video and audio versions for all the past episodes of the Fat Burning Man Show for free. Better yet, enter your email at fatburningman.com, sign up for my newsletter, and I'll even send you a quick start guide so you can take your health into your own hands right now, along with a few of our ridiculously tasty recipes as a special thanks for signing up. Once again, just go to fatburningman.com right now, enter your best email to get your free goodies with a bonus surprise straight to your inbox. This is Abel James signing off. Thank you so much for listening once again and have a great week.